Hello, welcome to Musculoskeletal Ultrasound. Today we're going to talk about how uh, muscle as well as bone and joint spaces, tendon, fat, and fluid look like on ultrasound. And we'll briefly go over the anatomy of the hand, the elbow, as well as the shoulder. So with the hand, you need a water bath or a gel block for transmission of the sound waves. Um, we'll be evaluating the MCP joint primarily, but you can also see the uh, PIP and DIP joints. And then we'll take a look at the extensor tendon. So hand ultrasound is relatively straightforward, and it can give you a lot of great detail about the anatomy. Here we're using a water bath consisting of a bedpan filled with water, and we put the patient's hand in the water bath. We're using a high-frequency linear probe, which gives us a lot more detail than other probes. And we're going to focus on the index finger. Because the probe is perpendicular to the index finger, this is considered a short axis view of the index finger. And when we start going, you can see that essentially we go from hand to the actual individual digits on ultrasound on the right. And here we see that you don't need to touch the skin on using a water bath because the water transmits the sound very well. Second, you have skin, which appears pretty discreet and hyperechoic in a water bath. And then below, you actually have the cortex of the bone. This is a long axis view. You focus still on the index finger, and you uh, flip the probes of the indicator points towards the wrist. And the patient is actually hyperextending his finger so that you can see that joint space move, as well as the extensor tendon above moving. So in this still image, you have both the metacarpal as well as the proximal phalanx. And in the middle, in the joint space itself, it looks kind of like a seagull flying at you. And that's why we call it a seagull sign. Up above, you have the extensor tendon, which has a long fibular pattern. And remember that the extensor tendon as well as the flexor tendons, their muscle bellies are actually in the forearm. And when those bellies contract, they pull the extensor tendon and that extend the, the digits as well as deflex the digits and it's kind of like a pulley system. Here we have uh, an image or a video of a, a hand abscess and you could see the extensor tendon quite well. You can see that there's a, a pocket of anechoic or hypochoic fluid that is pushing against the extensor tendon and again this is the extensor tendon right here and this is the abscess right here. The, in the abscess, there's actually some debris that looks like it's fairly hyperechoic. So the take home for hand is that bone is typically hyperechoic and can shadow distally. The seagull sign signifies the joint space. Tendon has a fibular or striated pattern and can move with finger movement. And fluid collection on in the hand as well as anywhere else in the soft tissue appears hypoechoic or anechoic. So elbow ultrasound is pretty complicated, but today we're actually just going to look at how the triceps muscle looks in short and long axis. And we'll also look at the lecranon fossa and uh, evaluate the posterior fat pad. So your posterior fat pad lies in the lecranon fossa and it's typically hidden on a lateral x-ray. For the posterior elbow ultrasound, you basically want to get first a short axis, um, starting with the mid-humerus, and scanning way, your way down to the actual elbow joint. And when you do that, you can appreciate a couple of different things. First, the humerus is hyperechoic, as bone should be, with some shadowing posterior to that, right here. And up on top is the triceps muscle. You have the lateral and medial bellies. And in short axis or cross section, the muscle appears punctate because you have these fibrils that are just coming towards you. And then if you scan more distally towards the lecranon fossa, you can see the medial condyle right here. The lateral condyle is here. And in between the lecranon fossa, and this is where the posterior fat pad lies, right here. If you draw a line from the medial condyle to the lateral condyle, your posterior fat pad should not be above that line. To get a, a long axis view of the elbow, you just basically point the probe towards the patient's head, and this is what you get on the long axis view. 
you have the triceps muscle, which is now in the long axis, so you actually see the individual fibrils in long axis, and it has that striated or fibular pattern as muscle and tendon does have in long axis. You also have the, the humerus, so this is the middle section of the humerus. You can actually see the lacrimal fossa, and in, inside you actually have the posterior fat pad. If you draw a line from the mid humerus to the distal humerus, most of your posterior fat pad should lay below that, uh, there could be a little f segment that is above that, but most of it should be below that. So what's the significance of a posterior fat pad that's elevated? Well, there's usually some fluid underneath that pushes that posterior fat pad above, and the differential diagnosis for that is inflammation, or it can be a, a pocket of, of, of an infected fluid, or it could be blood itself from a uh, hematoma from trauma. Typically in the ER, you see a lot of superchondral fractures in kids, and we evaluate for that based on an elevated posterior fat pad. So you can see on the image on the left, the red part right here it signifies blood and um, also inflammatory effusion, and it lifts this posterior fat pad up above. This is what you may see on an MRI, and this is what you typically see on an X-ray. This uh, radiolucent segment right here is the posterior fat pad that's now visible. And on ultrasound, this is what we see again. We remember we draw that line from the medial condyle to the lateral condyle, and you can see that that posterior fat, fat pad is definitely elevated. When we go to the long axis view right here, we can also note that it is, it, it is still elevated. So the take home points for elbow are that a muscle like the triceps muscle appears straighted in the long axis or fibular. And when it's in short axis, it looks punctate. An elevated posterior fat pad should lie in the olecranon fossa. And when it's elevated, it is pathologic. When we talk about the shoulder joint, we're really referring to the articulation of three bones, the scapula, the humerus, and the clavicle. Within the scapula, there's a posterior spine that courses superiorly and anteriorly to form the chromium. There's also an anterior projection of the scapula right here called the coracoid process. And when we talk about the joint itself, usually we, we're talking about the glenohumeral joint right here. But uh, note that uh, the other articulations of these three bones lend to the shoulder joint stability and function, and they are the acromial clavicular joint, the coracoacromial ligament, which forms an arch, as well as the coracoclavicular ligament. And lastly, there's a scapulothoracic joint, which is basically the scapula's articulation with the thoracic rib cage. This is an end faced view where you basically, if you had you ripped somebody's arm off, this is what you would see. You have the glenoid right here, which is the main articulation for the humeral head. You have the labrum, which is uh, essentially a capsule of fibrocartilaginous tissue that helps to further stabilize the humeral head. And out from that, you on the superior tubercle, you have the long head of the biceps tendon. And you also have three other glenohumeral ligaments, the superior, median, and inferior glenohumeral ligaments. Outer to that, you have the rotator cuff muscles. And above them, you actually have most of your bursa. And um, remember, we talked about the coracal uh, chromial arch right here. And it's an important anatomical concept to understand. The reason is that with the bursitis, you have pressure that's exerted downward because the arch itself is relatively fixed and stable. And with this downward exertion of pressure, you have impingement of the rotator cuff tendons. And over time, you just start to develop ischemia with this increased pressure, which can eventually lead to partial or full tears of the rotator cuff tendons. This is how you start to evaluate the anterior shoulder on ultrasound. You put the probe in a transverse or axial position. On the image on the, on the right, this is the greater tuberosity because our indicator is pointed laterally and the blue dot on the screen corresponds to the indicator. This makes this the lesser tuberosity medially and in between you have the bicipital groove in which the long head of the biceps tendon runs. Now we're going to fan a little bit 
and you could uh, see the biceps tendon coming in and out of view. And then we're going to rotate the probe 90 degrees to the patient's head, and uh, you start to see the long head of the biceps tendon in long axis, and that you see that nice long fibular pattern again. And we're going to course down inferiorly until we can see the insertion of the pectoralis muscle onto to the humerus itself. So anisotropy is uh, an artifact on ultrasound in which the, if the reflector is nice, smooth, and flat, as in muscle or tendon, it basically acts as a mirror. So if you look in the mirror um, straight on, then you'll see yourself. And that's what uh, happens if you actually have a perpendicular angle um, to the sound waves. But if that sound wave is off axis or not perpendicular, the sound waves don't actually come back to the probe. And so the image actually appears dark and that can fool you because it can mean that there's nothing there or there's fluid when in reality the tendon is still there. And this is what we typically see, the long head of the biceps tendon in short axis. Um, the image on the left is when you're perpendicular to the long head of the biceps tendon. And you could see that it's nice, bright, and white. But if you fan just a little bit, a few degrees off axis, it appears dark, like there's nothing there. And that's anisotropy. This is a biceps tendon partial tear. And what we see this on this ultrasound is that it's a long axis ultrasound of the biceps tendon. And you could see the, the biceps tendon right here. And there's fluid above that in the tendon sheath. And you can also see that there's some fibers that are torn off and they're just kind of like flailing in the fluid. This is a short axis view of a biceps complete tendon rupture. We see the bicipital groove here and there's nothing in here. And instead, we have this long biceps tendon that is not connected to the, the muscle belly. And you have a tremendous amount of blood and fluid right here. So moving on to the subscapularis, you want to go back into the position where you can see a short axis view of the long head of the biceps tendon. And what you're doing really is because you know that uh, the subscapularis attaches onto the lesser tuberosity and it's responsible for internal rotation, you actually need to externally rotate the patient's arm in order to view the, the subscapularis. And when you do that, there it is. And this is a subscapularis attached to the lesser tuberosity in long axis right here. Moving on to the supraspinatus, the supraspinatus is attached from the posterior scapula to the greater tuberosity and it's responsible for shoulder abduction to about 20 to 30 degrees as well as dynamic stabilization of the shoulder. And in order to get that, this is its neutral position right here. We need to actually extend the shoulder here we need to also internally rotate the shoulder so that the greater tuberosity courses medially. And um, this is where we can get it on ultrasound in the blue. So you actually have the patient kind of put their hands in the back pocket or on their hip to be able to view that. And this is what you get right here. This is the supraspinous insertion onto the greater tuberosity. And this is in long axis right here. And and if you note that the probe actually points towards to the patient's ear, and this is typically how you find that on ultrasound. This is a partial tear of the supraspinatus, and you can see that uh, this is the greater tuberosity where it inserts, and there is some fluid right here. And another tip-off is the slight dipping of the deltoid right here, which signifies a partial tear. And the, in the red right here, the insertion point, this is often referred to as the critical zone. This area has relatively less perfusion. So when you combine with impingement, you could see how this is an area ripe for pathology. The last ultrasound of this podcast will be on the posterior shoulder. And first we have to note our orientation. So this is anterior right here and this is posterior. And when we put the probe on the posterior shoulder, we have the indicator pointed laterally. And this is what we see. We see the skin and subcutaneous tissue 
superficially, we see the deltoid, and then we see the infraspinatus, which kind of looks like a wave right here. And we have the glenoid, which is medial. And then we have the humeral head, which is lateral. And in the middle, we actually have the labrum. This is the posterior labrum, and it look, kind of looks like a sail. So this is the approach on ultrasound. You start at the mid-humerus, and you go all the way up until the humeral head becomes big and knobbly. And then that's when you actually course medially and posteriorly. And you see that there's a clear infraspinatus right here. The posterior labrum is right here. And this is the glenoid. And then when you actually externally rotate the patient's shoulder, you actually see contraction of the infraspinatus in front of you. This is a shoulder dislocation. Note how the essentially the humeral head is below right here, and the infraspinatus is actually not a wave anymore. It's kind of more of a, like a waterfall, and it, it's pulled by the humeral head anteriorly. And this is how we diagnose the shoulder dislocation on ultrasound. So sometimes with our more muscular patients or bigger patients, or just with large joints in general, you can use a curvilinear transducer or C60 instead of the linear transducer. It gives you a broader field of view as well as uh, deeper penetration. So some of the bones and the joints may be a little bit better visualized. For example, right here, this is glenoid. This is the humerus. You could see the infraspinatus contracting with external rotation. So this is a normal shoulder on C60. Take a look at the abnormal one right here. You could see that the humerus is down or anteriorly displaced and uh, the glenoid is posteriorly right here. And there's also a needle. We're actually injecting the shoulder with lidocaine. So the take-home points for shoulder is that anisotropy can cause a structure like a muscle or tendon to appear hyper or anechoic depending on the angle of incidence of the sound wave. The rotator cuff muscles can be evaluated by ultrasound. On the anterior approach, you have the long head of the biceps tendon, the subscapularis, and the supraspinatus tendon. And on the posterior shoulder, you have the infraspinatus teres minor, which we didn't get to, as well as the glenoid, the posterior labrum, and the humeral head. So let's wrap this up. For hand ultrasound, remember always to use a water bath. Remember that you can evaluate for an abscess or foreign body as well as tendon injury on hand ultrasound. For elbow ultrasound, we're looking posteriorly for that elevated fat pad. Remember that's always pathologic. Um, and with elbow and shoulder, um, even though we didn't really get into this, you can actually use it for procedural guidance too. So you can do an arthrocentesis on, on the elbow. For the shoulder, we're looking for both rotator cuff injury as well as an anterior shoulder dislocation. And again, you could do an arthrocentesis as well as injection of, of lidocaine for uh, pain relief. Thank you again for your attention to this podcast. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to contact me. This is my email address. And this is our website. Um, it has a lot of good clinical resources and a lot of other ultrasound information for those that are interested.